Our next guest, let's bring in California Democratic Congressman Ro Khanna. Congressman, good to be with you. So you've called these work requirements for Medicare, Medicaid, SNAP, and other programs a, quote, non-starter. Let's go back to 1996, when President Bill Clinton touted the Welfare to Work bill, which had work requirements for people on welfare. Listen here. Today we are ending welfare as we know it. But I hope this day will be remembered not for what it ended, but for what it began. A new day that offers hope, honors responsibility, rewards work, and changes the terms of the debate so that no one in America ever feels again the need to criticize people who are poor on welfare. So Clinton hailed welfare to work and the work requirements contained within as revolutionary. So if work requirements were good back then, why aren't they good now? Well, we have work requirements, as you pointed out. But what the Republican plan would do is impose a lot of bureaucratic snafus on people who genuinely are out of work and genuinely need the food stamps. And there have been studies that have shown that additional work requirements aren't going to get people back to work. They're just going to take away food and other benefits from people who need them. You know, the bipartisan concern back in 1996 was that if, if you don't put in work requirements or, or if you don't tighten up work requirements, that you're going to create a culture of dependency. But there are many Republicans, and you've probably heard this, who believe that that's what the Democratic Party wants to do, is create a culture of dependency, which ensures votes for Democrats who will continue those policies. What do you say? I disagree with that. I believe in work. I believe that, obviously, we should reward work. But here, when you look at the actual studies, as I said, uh, it doesn't make people work. If you put in additional requirements to what actually exists, it's actually just taking away food and benefits at a time where the economy is uh, somewhat shaky and people need that. And here's the other thing. This actually isn't going to save a lot of money. I mean, why don't we look at the big ticket items that are actually going to save a lot of money, such as uh, the tax cuts to the very wealthy, such as the fact that our defense budget is over 50 percent of our discretionary spend, such as the fact that we could have neutrality in hospital fees so hospitals don't charge more than your doctor's office for a medical procedure. That's where we'd get big savings. But if you are cut defense spending with China building up its defense spending and its military at the breakneck pace, do you not, Congressman, risk falling behind? We absolutely have to be strong in the Pacific. And I'm for giving Taiwan more weapons. I'm for having naval superiority there. But we have a lot of waste in uh, the defense budget, which is going to defense contractors, which are going for some programs that are outdated or not necessarily necessary. And there are some people on the Republican caucus who have also said, let's look at defense. I'm just saying, let's look at the actual items that would lower the defense, uh, the, the deficit. If people want to argue on work requirements that I disagree, let's argue about them. But let's not pretend that that's somehow going to reduce uh, deficits in, that, in this country. That's a very small relative number. So we don't know what, if anything, President Biden has agreed to. But according to Speaker McCarthy, he has agreed to negotiate directly. And the president reiterated that today before uh, he leaves on his trip to the G7 in Japan. But he did sound an optimistic note that he thinks that something can get done. Listen to what he said. I'm confident that we'll get the agreement on the budget that America will not default. Not default, which is an important thing because we know the consequences of default. But we don't know, again, what the president is signing on to with Speaker McCarthy. Will, will you just agree to anything that the president says is good with him? No. We have a uh, constitutional democracy where I get a vote as a member of Congress mm -hmm. uh, in a separate branch. And I, I just think the president should... Uh, pay the debts. I mean, he is the authority to do that. Congress has told him to pay this money. We've already passed legislation. He should honor that and pay it. And I, I don't think uh, uh, should be negotiating on the debt ceiling. We can separately talk about uh, what we need to do to reduce the, the deficit. But of course, I'm going to review it to see if it's good for my constituency and good for the country. You know, as, as always, when we bring you on, we like to talk about your home state, California, which has gone from a COVID-era surplus to now $32 billion in debt, according to the governor. But California is now considering paying illegal migrants $300 a week for 20 weeks at a cost of what could be $385 million. Uh, that on top of the plan for reparations, which could cost uh, upwards of $800 billion. I mean, I, I might have missed it, but I don't think the state of California has got its own Bureau of Printing and Engraving. Where are you going to get the money for all this? 
Well, look, I, I think that we made a mistake actually handing out uh, checks uh, well past uh, COVID, and uh, the governor had done that close to, to the midterms. Mm -hmm. And now they're going to have to make some hard choices. Uh, I do think there is a, a, some sense where they can get uh, additional revenue, but the governor is going to have to figure out how to have a, a, a balanced budget because, as you know, states can't, can't run deficits. Right. Well, I, and again, that reparations price tag is two and a half times California's annual budget. So I don't know where you'd ever get the money for that. Congressman Rokana, good to catch up with you. Thanks for joining us. Appreciate it. Appreciate it.